Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's a haunting question. Between vision and seeing is that when you see something, you're just taking in data. When you have a vision of something, you are being brought into what that data means. For instance, I see trees. An artist sees the wonders of color and the magnificent structures and has a vision beyond what you just see. That's why the Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. See, you can know all the facts. You can have all the data about life, but it takes a vision of what it means and of what's going on. And our prayer is that Christ Jesus would be our vision, that every time we assemble, we would see Jesus beyond what the world sees, and we would have a vision of the glory of of Christ. We're going to experience something of that in a few moments in the book of Isaiah. You may want to turn there. It's Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, there I pray that we will again encounter a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah was a prophet who wrote, oh, roughly 700 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, and the main ministry of Isaiah's prophetic uh, preaching uh, was to guide the nation to keep its eyes on God rather than on other things. You see, at that time, roughly 700 uh, B.C., uh, the nation of Israel had the empire of Assyria to the north. And the Assyrian empire had a hobby. Their hobby was to conquer other nations and to in, in influence them and, and uh, uh, you know, exploit them and those kinds of things. So Israel was constantly experiencing the domination and the power of the Assyrian Empire to the north. Now, to the south was Egypt, and Egypt was also something of a world power, and it was the lot of Israel that they were always caught between the Assyrian Empire and the Egyptian Empire. Now, it came about in the days of Isaiah that the Assyrian Empire was experiencing some internal stress, and so their influence sort of on the outer edges of the empire was, was being drawn back just a little bit, and all their energy was being spent on internal struggles and politics. What that meant for Israel was that they were sort of coming out from under the domination of Assyria. It was still there, but they were coming out from under it, and they were experiencing a time of, of prosperity and a great time of moving forward and culturally and socially and politically and all those good, good kinds of things. Uh, they, they were sort of growing and, and, and enriching uh, the life of the nation. Now, at that time then, e Egypt comes along and sort of offers an alternative from being dominated by Assyria, maybe Egypt can set us free entirely from the Assyrians. And so what Israel wanted to do was to let Egypt be its salvation, to go to Egypt and say, hey, look, if you'll bring your army in, uh, this would be a great thing. Now's the time to strike. You can conquer Assyria, push them out. Uh, we, we can work this thing out together. And Isaiah's basic message, if you want to boil it down, is do not think that any man or nation can save you. Do not put your trust in armies and horses or chariots and airplanes and drones. Don't put your trust in the trappings that look good. I want you to look beyond that and see what this is really all about. And so your salvation won't come from Egypt. It will come from the Lord. It will come from God. And that was Isaiah's preaching ministry. And in the course of that, he mentions a figure, um, the, the phrase is the servant of the Lord. The Ebed Yahweh is the Hebrew for it. And uh, he mentions this servant of the Lord several times in the book of Isaiah. 
Some scholars have said this servant must be Isaiah himself. He's a servant of the Lord. He's writing, well, the servant of the Lord. And so the passages that talk about the servant of the Lord, that must be Isaiah. The problem is they don't match Isaiah. It, ju it just doesn't match who Isaiah was and what he was doing. Others have said, well, Israel must be the servant of the Lord. After all, the nation of Israel uh, was called out to be a light to the nations and to exalt and magnify God, and uh, therefore uh, the, the nation of Israel must be uh, the, um, uh, the, the servant of the Lord, the servant of God. And uh, the problem with that is the descriptions don't match the nation of Israel. In fact, what happens is these servant songs is what they're called, but as, as Isaiah talks about the servant of the Lord, it becomes much more uh, focused and focused until he's talking about just one person. That's what we'll read about in a moment in Isaiah 53. So it can't be the nation of Israel, can't be the prophet Isaiah. Some would say, well, maybe it's a king. Maybe it's a future king who will, who will rise up, and he will be the one through whom God works to bring salvation to the people. The problem with that is that as we read Isaiah 53 together, not a single prophecy of Isaiah 53 matches any king in human history. In fact, there is no person in human history that can fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53 except for Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one for whom what we're about to read in the book of Isaiah is a perfect match. And so as we read Isaiah 53 in a moment, we're reading what God gave to Isaiah some 700 years before Jesus was born so that the people would have a vision of their Messiah, a vision of the servant of God, the vision of the one who would bring salvation to them. And as we read that, uh, just from what you know about Jesus, you'll see it matching up beautifully and wonderfully well. So that's what we're looking at is the portrait of Jesus in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. I hope you have your text in front of you and uh, have your finger ready to scroll along. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is his arm to accomplish his purposes, to bring salvation to the nation. For he, that is the Messiah, grew up before him, that is the Lord. He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was, he has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
and out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressions, transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, open our eyes. Open our eyes that we can see Jesus. Open our eyes that we would see him not just in the historical data, but, Father, in the beauty and the perfection of your will for us. Father, open our eyes that we would see not just the incidents of miracles and teaching, but, Father, that we would see on display before us the very power of the kingdom of God. Father, open our eyes so that we would look beyond the momentary affliction and heartache and pain of our own lives and there have a vision of the pain and the heartache and the suffering of Christ as he takes our burden and sets us free. Father, open our eyes that we would see more than just what is around us, beyond what is just before us. Father, that we would see into eternity and by the power of your Holy Spirit come to know the depth and the purposes of your will. Father, open our eyes that we may see the glory of Jesus Christ. And having seen him as he is, Father, your Holy Spirit, let your Spirit move us to embrace him, cause us to love him, wrap our arms around him, that we might love him for who he truly, truly is. Father, glorify yourself as you show us this vision of Christ. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have your text or your electronic device open to the portrait of Christ in Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, when I was growing up in the last century, but in our home, it's okay, you can upstage me. <laughs> but in our home, there was a, a portrait of, anybody else? Okay. One last. We're good to go? Okay. <laughs> Top that one. Don't, don't, don't. Don't. <laughs> Okay, where were you? <laughs> in the home where I grew up, there was a portrait of Christ that uh, hung in the hallway somewhere. And, uh, we, we had several houses being military moved around, and, and this portrait traveled with us. It was a, the head of Christ. It was painted by a man by the name of, of Warner Salmon. He painted the first version of it in 1924 and kept pr uh, either drawing or painting other versions of it, but it's known as the head of Christ. You, you may be familiar with that. It's, it's the portrait of Jesus with the nice brown flowing hair. It was long hair, but it was okay because it was Jesus. Um, <laughs> but he, he's just looking off, just a beautiful complexion, beautiful face, uh, just the, the kind of, of picture that you, you would imagine. Wow, well, Jesus must have looked at that. And that, that portrait of Jesus is probably the first a sort of mental image that I have of, of Jesus in my life. Um, I know now that whatever Jesus looked like, we can be almost positive he did not look like Solomon's head of Christ portrait because we don't know what Jesus looked like. Um, you know, we lived in Japan, and I remember that uh, uh, portraits and paintings of Jesus in Japan, he was Japanese. And if you look at African-American art, uh, you, you'll notice that Jesus is, is African-American. It seems like every culture and every nation, when they want to portray Jesus, they want to paint him to look just like we are, so that we're comfortable with him, that he doesn't look too strange, and, and so that we have this, this portrait of Jesus that we can live with. You know? 
And so we had Solomon's head of Christ. Uh, uh, there were some 500 million copies of that painting distributed all over the world. And a lot of us, that's, that's what we think. That's, that must be what Jesus looked like. But if we were to draw a portrait of Christ, what would we draw? Some would draw a, a head portrait, and that would be it, you know, like Solomon's head of Christ. Others might draw the crucifixion and have the cross on a lonely hill with the sunset in the background and, and you know, that kind of thing. We might draw the picture of, of an empty tomb and the bright light coming out of it. Uh, Debbie's father was a, a Methodist pastor, and in his office behind his desk, was behind it, was a very, very large uh, painting. It was called uh, The Road to Emmaus, and it was just this beautiful, beautiful painting with the trees and the road, and I think there's a brook in there and, and all this other sort of anachronistic stuff that wasn't in Palestine. But it's a beautiful painting, and, and there's three figures in the middle of it. It's the two disciples and Jesus on the road to Emmaus. If you want to know what that looks like, just go to the, um, the lobby just outside the chapel. You'll see it on the, on the, on the wall there, um, um, courtesy of yours truly. So, um, uh, you know, but what would we draw as a portrait of Christ? It's interesting to me that when the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to present a portrait of the Messiah, of the suffering servant, it's evident to us today in a way that it could not have been even to Isaiah that he chose the cross. He says, here's what you must look at. Here's what I want you to see. Here's the vision I want you to have of who the Messiah is. And he didn't talk about grandeur. He didn't talk about glory. He didn't talk about wealth. He didn't talk about those things that we view as trappings of successful life. He talked about a Messiah who was wounded and bruised, despised, rejected, killed, and offered up as a sacrifice. So Isaiah gives us a portrait, and he says, this portrait is about the vision of Christ." what he has done for us on the cross. Let, let me just tease out a, a, a few of the um, uh, aspects of this portrait. If, if, uh, if we were to look at a painting and had uh, some kind of artist uh, uh, in front of the painting or someone who studied such things, uh, they, they would probably point out the brushwork and the, and the coloring, the shading perspective, and things like that. So I, I just want to uh, point to a couple of things. Uh, uh, if time might elude us if we read all the verses again. Um, but uh, what a powerful passage of Scripture. But, um, it, but there, there's things here that we need to keep in mind. These are parts of the portrait of the Messiah. And the first part of it is I want for us to look at is in, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sitting here saying I really want verse 3. But verse 2 is really good. You know, verse 1, <laughs> but verse 3, look at verse 3. He was despised. And rejected by men. What kind of Savior is that? What kind of Savior is despised and rejected by men? He can't even win their vote in the primary in his home country. They reject him totally and entirely. You see, we, we celebrate the person who can gather a crowd. We like the person who can, who can be successful and all acclaim him and, and just cheer on with, with thousands, tens of thousands in a throng just celebrating, great guy, great guy, great guy. The Scripture says that our Messiah is despised and rejected by men. See, most of who Jesus is, we don't like. Most of who Jesus is, we reject because Jesus comes to us as one who owns nothing. He owns a coat, but he has nowhere to lay his head. He doesn't have a retirement account. He's not very good at investing, evidently. He doesn't own property. All those things that we want desperately for our lives, Jesus doesn't have. And not only that, he says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be that way too. And we don't like that. So we reject it, and we despise it. We like the person who has power. Here's a man who goes to the cross, and he's crucified. 
the, the things that Jesus, I, I, I was thinking this week about folks who say, well, I just think Jesus is a great teacher. No, you don't. Because Jesus said things like you've got to lose your life in order to save it. I don't want to do that. That's not a great teaching. Jesus said, if you want to be greatest of all, you have to be the servant of all. You've got to get out on your hands and knees and start washing feet. And when you come to the Judas Iscariot in your life, you better wash his feet too. I don't want that. That's not great teaching. What kind of great teacher says that you've got to go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor? That's not a great teaching. Next time somebody tells you Jesus is a great teacher, you, you ask them, what's so great about it? By the way, the greatness of the, of the teaching of Jesus is that he said things like, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Amen. That's the greatness of his teaching. Well, all of it's great, but you understand what I'm saying. But we despise him, and we reject him. And in the natural course of things, he is not the example of humanity that we want to follow. So God sends the Messiah. First thing we do is we reject him, or, or even just as bad, we are indifferent towards him. We figure, well, there'll be more time later. Maybe we'll, we'll check in later, but right now I'm too busy. I'm too preoccupied. But he was despised, rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Now, to the sinful world, this is, this is a disqualifier. I mean, it's sort of like a guy who uh, goes bankrupt several times, standing up and tell you that he knows how to run uh, your economy and, um, you know, he, he can make you rich or something. You know, it doesn't make sense. But this, but this guy is, what is he? He's filled with sorrow and grief in his life. That's, that's the very thing I want to get rid of. That I, I don't want sorrow and grief in my life, but here comes a Messiah and he's acquainted with it. You know, but, let's skip to the end of the sermon. Here's the great thing. He knows our sorrows and he knows our griefs and he knows them from the inside. You know, your struggles this morning and your heartaches this morning, the pain in your soul this morning, these things are not theoretical to Jesus. They are experiences as he has taken them upon himself. Wonderful portrait. Okay. He was despised, acquainted with our grief. And as one whom men hid their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. We did not value Jesus. We didn't think he was worth that much. And you can tell that by the way we spend our time, not with Jesus. You can tell by the way we, we, we use our resources, not for Jesus. You can tell it by the way we shape our lives, it's not for Jesus. See, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit transforming our, our thoughts and giving us a vision beyond sight, we really don't want Jesus we don't value him. Oh, folks, you know, one of, one of the greatest problems in life today is having a sense of value that someone would think I'm worthwhile, that I'm worth something. We do all kinds of nutty things to try and feel like we are worth something. We marry the wrong person. We join gangs, call them clubs. Uh, you know, we get a circle of friends that that will pat us on the back and say, you know, you're one of us until you, until you step out of line and then we'll kick you out. You know, we, we have all kinds of, of, of dysfunctional things we do just to have somebody say, you're valuable in my sight. We did not value Jesus. And the remarkable thing is the moment you value Jesus as the greatest treasure of your life is the moment you will know that you are the greatest treasure of God's heart. And that's how we come to know that we are valuable. But here's what we did with the Messiah. We esteemed him not. So Jesus sent, the Messiah sent, the world rejects him. We in the flesh, in the sinful, um, uh, um, uh, you know, state of our condition, um, that, that, that's what we do. We reject him. Um, I'm sorry. I wanted to go to verse 5, but, but I can't skip verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken by God. We looked at the Messiah and said, you know, God didn't like him. How, how could God like him? How could God like him if he let him be crucified? You know what happens if you talk to a Muslim about Jesus? You know that if you say to a Muslim, Jesus was crucified, no way, your Muslim friend will say. There's no way that God would let that happen. God, uh, Jesus was a righteous man. He was a holy man. He was a good man. He lived a great life. He was, he was totally obedient to God. God would not allow a man that righteous to die a shameful death. 
And here's where Islam goes its way and we go ours. Amen. Because Jesus Christ was crucified for us. Amen. He was stricken for us. We look at the cross and we say, that is the sign of a failed life. But when the Holy Spirit changes your heart and your mind and you start to have a vision of who Christ really is, then you look at the cross and you say, that is the sign of the immeasurable, eternal mercy, love, and grace of God toward us. He says, here's what we did. We esteemed him. We counted him stricken by God. God, God is rejecting him, uh, and, and so do we. Okay, uh, on, on to verse 5. But, but he was pierced for our transgressions. See, it wasn't the sin of Jesus. Jesus didn't have any sin. It wasn't his sin that put him on the cross. It was our sins, our transgressions that put him on the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, we are healed. When you see the cross, you're seeing a healing service going on. You're seeing all the sicknesses of the soul and all the maladies of the heart cured and healed. You're seeing the sin, sickness taken away by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As our chastisement, our punishment is put upon him. And what we deserve, he experiences. What he did not deserve, he takes from us. So we have this vision of Christ, and it is the cross. He's pierced for our transgressions. This is who Jesus is. You know, we're kind of like sheep. You know, each one of us, we've gone our own way. That's why we don't, don't want Jesus. That's why we reject him. We, we like our own insight into the world. You ever read the book of Judges? Do it sometimes. You'll find this refrain over and over again. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's the story of mankind. I mean, it's hard to believe, but there was, there was a whole nation, and this nation said, truth is relative. This whole nation said, well, it's, I can do whatever I want to do as long as nobody else gets hurt. You know, that, that kind of silly thought. Um, it, it was a nation founded on the idea that, that morality and truth and goodness are all relative to who you are, and you can just sort of chart your own course, and your course is as good as any other. We are all like sheep, every one of us, and we have gone astray, following our noses to the ground, and we're wandering off the cliff. That's who we are. But, oh, let's skip down to verse, uh, let's go to verse 9. But Jesus died for us. Our, our, our sins were put upon him. Um, he, he died in our place. Verse 9, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. By the way, in 700 B.C., this is kind of a silly prophecy. I mean, seriously, it's a silly prophecy. It's not just that, wow, Isaiah, that, that's, uh, that's clever. I don't know how that... You, you would look at that in 700 B.C. and you say, Isaiah, not only do we not understand it, that does not make sense. How can his grave be with the wicked and yet also with the rich? Isaiah, we all know that if someone's rich, it's because God has blessed them. If they're wealthy, it's because God really likes them and loves them. And so they're, they're like really the, uh, the, the ultimate example of who you should be uh, before God. So that's who the rich are. The wicked, of course, are on the other end of the scale. How can he be buried with both the rich and the wicked? That doesn't make sense. And for 700 years in your liberal scholarship, you would have pointed out how Isaiah could not possibly be a prophet because he predicted something that is nonsensical and makes no sense at all until you have a vision of the cross. And there Jesus dying between two malefactors, traditionally thieves on either side, in the midst of wickedness. And all the grace of God that he touched the heart of that one thief who said, remember me when you come into my kingdom. And Jesus said, you know, today, this this day, today, you'll be with me in paradise. But he died among the wicked. And then Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, by the way, claimed the body and took the body of Jesus to a tomb that Joseph had dug and carved out of the, out of the hillside for himself and for his family. And there Jesus was buried in the tomb of a rich man. 
And now we're looking at it and saying, how did Isaiah pull that off? How did he manage to predict that? How is it that the Holy Spirit has always opened up the hearts and the eyes and the minds of, of God's people to see beyond the data that they thought they knew to see a vision of what God was doing? Jesus was dead and buried and placed in the tomb for us. God sent him. We killed him. And when we buried him in the tomb, we thought that was the end of it. Today, you haven't gone to the tomb and placed the body there and rolled the stone across the, the entrance, but what you have done is you have decided that Jesus is not worthy of your life, and so you have buried him in some far distant corner of your life. You have rolled the stone over the grave, and you think you are done with the Son of Man. You think because he, has, he is dead to you that you can go your own way and have your own uh, uh, sort of will and your own destiny and, and chart your own course. You think that he has been buried and he is gone but yet verse 10 yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him this is what God was doing all along it was the will of the Lord to crush him he God has put him to grief when his soul when the soul of the Messiah makes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days folks we're we're here Verse 9, stone rolled across the tomb. Verse 10, it's rolled away and Jesus is risen. Amen. It's rolled away in the Messiah's days. It says the days are prolonged. He lives for everlasting glory, ascended into heaven, where he makes intercession for us now, and from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. This Jesus is risen. So Isaiah said, I've got this vision of the Messiah, and he is dead, and he is buried, and his days are prolonged. It says his offspring are many. Uh, what that means is that he brings us as adopted children of God into the kingdom, into the family of God. He has brothers and sisters adopted by his own blood. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. All of this happening after the, the effective work of Christ on the cross. So the stone is rolled away, and Jesus is risen. You killed him, God raised him. All right. By the way, I killed him too. I'm not saying that. Wow. Um, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. What was the will? The will of the Lord was to crush him, but the will of the Lord was to put our iniquities upon him. The will of the Lord was that he should be pierced on our behalf. The will of the Lord is that he should take our sin upon him, that his righteousness might be given to us. We'll see that in a minute. And so that is the will of the Lord, and it's going to prosper in Jesus. This is what God is doing in the Messiah. In verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, out of the anguish of his soul, the Messiah shall see and be satisfied. Oh, what a wonder this is, that Jesus Christ, who dies for us, when it's all said and done, he looks out over his redemptive work. He sees his blood applied to the sin-sick, stained souls and hearts of men and women. And he sees those souls and those hearts cleansed, born again, brought into life everlasting, a, re a resurrection life. He sees that, and the Messiah is satisfied. You know, I kind of like that. I like the fact that he's satisfied with his work, that I don't have to bring some work, some action on my part to satisfy him. He is satisfied with me by the shed blood. Now, I want to live a life that glorifies him. I want to live a life that is pleasing to him. I want to live a life that is reflective of his great grace towards us in dying for me. I want to live that kind of life. But he is satisfied with his own work of redemption. He is satisfied that his blood is sufficient for us. So it says he will see and be satisfied by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, the Messiah, he shall make many to be counted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. I don't think I'm making this up. It says that we are counted righteous because of Jesus Christ. And it says that our iniquity and our sin is placed on him. Am I reading it right? Yes. I'm not twisting anything here. 
See, when he died on the cross, the guilt and the shame and the weight of our sin and our rebellion against God and our rejection of the Messiah, all that was taken and it was put on Christ, and he died under the weight of our sins. And his righteousness, God has taken and he has placed it upon us. Here's what that means. It means that one day I'll walk into the courts of heaven. I'll walk into the very presence of God. Folks, I can't explain it, but I just know the Bible promises it. And when I walk into the court, uh, the courts of God's heaven, he'll look at me and he won't see my sin and he won't see my rebellion and he won't see the darkness in my life and my heart. He won't see all those things that have, have, have just twisted and distorted my life. He won't see those things. He's going to look at me and the Bible just said he will see the righteousness of Christ. He will see the righteousness of Jesus. And when that angel says, by what right do you come in to this court? The answer is, See, Jesus, I'm with him. And we walk in not in our own power, not in our own righteousness, but by the power, by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is given to us. It's a gift. Our iniquity on him, his righteousness on us. That's grace. That's that's the wonderful grace of God. So um, Isaiah says, this this is what you need to think of. Um, Okay, let's, let's close it there. I asked you, what, what would be the portrait of Jesus that you would paint? And this morning, I suggest that the greatest portrait is the portrait of the cross, the cross that leads to the resurrection of Christ. Because by his death and his resurrection, we are made whole, we are healed, we are cleansed, we are given new life in Christ. My prayer for you this morning is that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Now, notice I didn't say, if you don't go to church. You do go to church. You're here. Although those listening by television and the Internet. (laughs) But the question isn't, did you go to church? The question isn't even, were you baptized as a child in some kind of muddled moment? The question is, have you come to the cross where the Holy Spirit has convicted you of your sin and led you to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior and motivated your arms to embrace him and given you the strength to follow him and given you the desire and the longing to love him? That's the question. And if you don't know Jesus, I just want to hold this picture up in front of you and pray that you fall in love with him. Beloved in Christ, those of you who are brothers and sisters in Christ, it's been a long time. Has it been a long time since you just spent time telling Jesus how much you loved him and realized how much your life needs to belong to him? Have you put him off in a corner somewhere, hung his picture on the wall in the hallway? Or do you have a vision of who Christ is that would draw you forward and define your life? My prayer is that you would have a vision of Jesus who died for us, that we might live. Let's pray together. Father, what a magnificent prophecy you gave to Isaiah. What a wonderful fulfillment we have in Jesus. And what a miracle we know that that grace touches our lives and calls us to you. Father, I ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to plant within every heart, within every every life here this morning, a keen desire that Jesus would be before all, above all, high, exalted, lifted up, that Jesus would be loved and treasured and adored. Father, that your Holy Spirit would bring us to Christ there to know your grace in him. Father, I ask that you do this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.